Hi, my name is Dumisani Washington, and I'm the director of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. I want to talk to you today about Dr. Martin Luther King's pro-Israel legacy. There's a lot of controversy and propaganda surrounding the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Both sides choose Dr. King as their champion. So let's take a moment to answer some of the most basic questions. Question number one, was Dr. King pro-Israel? Dr. King was a staunch supporter of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, but this does not mean that he was anti-Palestinian. In fact, he embodied both ideologies, proving that one does not have to be anti-Palestinian to be pro-Israel, or anti-Israel to be pro-Palestinian. We have his own words to that effect. On March 26, 1968, Dr. King was the honored guest at the 68th Annual Convention for the Rabbinical Assembly of Conservative Judaism. Yes, 10 days before he was assassinated, Dr. King was with his good friend Rabbi Joshua Heschel and other rabbis as they discussed foreign policy, domestic policy, and a host of other things. At that meeting, he was asked about the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Dr. King, what would you say if you were talking to a Negro intellectual, an editor of a national magazine, and were told, as I have been, that he supported the Arabs against Israel because color is all important in this world? In the editor's opinion, the Arabs are colored Asians and the Israelis are white Europeans. Would you point out that more than half of the Israelis are Asian Jews with the same pigmentation as Arabs? Or would you suggest that an American Negro should not form judgments on the basis of color? What seems to you an appropriate response? Wow, that's a deep question. And Dr. King took the opportunity to address each of the three issues that were presented in that question. Race, the Israelis, the Arabs or Palestinians. It should be noted that in 1968, the term Palestinian was not yet used to refer to the Arab people of the region. That would not happen until much later on in the mid 1970s. On the Middle East crisis, we have had various responses. The response of some of the so-called young militants does not represent the position of the vast majority of Negroes. There are some who are color consumed and they see a kind of mystique in being colored and anything non-colored is condemned. We do not follow that course in the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, and certainly most of the organizations in the Civil Rights Movement do not follow that course. In addressing the issue of race, Dr. King echoed his I have a dream speech from five years earlier, not by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. He let the rabbis know that he and the African American community would judge the Middle East issues based on their merits, not on race. Peace for Israel means security, and we must stand with all of our might to protect its right to exist, its territorial integrity. I see Israel, and never mind saying it, as one of the great outposts of democracy in the world, and a marvelous example of what can be done, how desert land almost can be transformed into an oasis of brotherhood and democracy. Peace for Israel means security, and that security must be a reality. After addressing the issue of race, Dr. King then moved to the Israelis, and his main focus was security. Peace for Israel means security, and we must stand with all of our might to protect its right to exist. It should be noted here that the date, March 26, 1968, was some nine months after Israel's 1967 or Six Day War, a war in which it defended itself against Egypt, Lebanon, Syria, and Jordan, and was in possession of lands that it no longer possesses now. At no time did Dr. King ever dismiss Israel as a colonial or an imperialist power. He just simply said, Israel has the right to exist and we must protect its sovereignty. On the other hand, we must see what peace for the Arabs mean in a real sense of security on another level. Peace for the Arabs means the kind of economic security that they so desperately need. These nations, as you know, are part of that third world of hunger, of disease, of illiteracy. I think that as long as these conditions exist, there will be tensions. There will be the endless quest to find scapegoats. So there is a need for a martial plan for the Middle East where we lift those who are at the bottom of the economic ladder and bring them into the mainstream of economic security. Finally, Dr. King turned his attention to the Arab or Palestinian people, and his main focus this time was economic security. Dr. King said that there should be a Marshall Plan that was directed to lift the Arab people out of poverty and bring them into the mainstream of economic security. Here it should be noted that over the last 19 years, the Palestinian Authority has received the equivalent of 25 Marshall Plans, tens of billions of dollars to go to do exactly what Dr. King advocated, yet poverty persists in the Palestinian territories. Mahmoud Abbas, Palestinian Authority President, makes a reported $1 million a month. 
the Palestinian Authority itself, receives an annual budget of about $2 billion. In the area of Gaza, population of about 1.6 million, Hamas, the ruling party, boasts some 1,700 millionaires. We don't know exactly what Dr. King would say if he were here, but we would have to assume that when he said Marshall Plan, he was not talking about wealth for the upper echelons of the rulership and poverty for the rest of the Palestinian people.